Okay, so, uh, the Ryordan verse. You've probably heard about it. It started off with Percy Jackson and the Olympians, and since then it has expanded to include a couple of other series. There's Percy Jackson, which was the original, there's the Heroes of Olympus, uh, the Trials of Apollo, which I actually haven't read, I'll get to that in a sec, uh, the Kane Chronicles, and Magnus Chase and the Gods of Asgard. Those are all... <laughs> those are all in one expanded universe, and if you're at all familiar with them, then, well, you were probably a fan of them as a kid, or at least if you're my age and you're familiar with them, you were probably a fan of them as a kid. They're basically just the same formula as Harry Potter, where, like, you know, normal kid suddenly gets swept up into this hidden magical world, finds out he's an important part of it, and then goes on adventures and stuff. Like, same basic idea, but I already did a video a while ago about how I feel that Percy Jackson really, mm, let's say, refines the formula, makes it better. You could say perfected it. I don't know if I'd go quite that far. I know I did in the title of that video, but that's beside the point. I only just recently finished reading the Magnus Chase books because I tried reading the first one years ago when it first came out, and I just couldn't quite get into it. You know, it felt a little too formulaic at that point. Like, it was just kind of more of the same stuff, and while I didn't dislike it, it was just kind of, eh, I'm, I might just be too old for this now. But I did finish the rest of the series, and I will say it gets better. And people kind of wanted me to do a whole overview of the Riordan Ry verse, Riordan verse. I still, <laughs> I can never say that guy's name right, but... People wanted me to do a whole overview of that, and luckily I was already planning on doing that. And I don't really think there's an intellectual way of doing that, really, so this would probably be more of an informal discussion type thing. This is, this is just how I feel like doing it. But before we can do that, I will do a quick review of Magnus Chase and just how I feel about those. I think it'll just be a good way to warm up. So first up, we have Magnus Chase and the Sword of Summer, which is... The first book in the series, and like I said, I read it years ago, and then I reread it, and I feel kind of the same way about it, you know? It's not bad, and I did learn to appreciate a few aspects of it that I couldn't quite get into before, but it is still just kind of the same stuff, you know? Uh, the only way it really mixes up the formula, I think, is that it does not waste any time getting to the magical stuff. Like, with Harry Potter and most of its clones, or at least the successful ones, including Percy Jackson, there is a pretty long time at the beginning of the story where you're just seeing the main character's regular life and how their regular life, regular life kind of sucks. And then, so when the magical world stuff starts, we have that contrast and we're like, yay, adventure! Whereas this one, we have like one chapter of normal stuff and we see how Magnus's life does really suck and then we just get thrown straight into everything, which I think is probably a good thing, especially because this book is longer than it needs to be, and not wasting time is good. Beyond that, it's pretty much what you would expect. Magnus dies, goes to Valhalla, becomes an Einherji, uh, and also learns that he's a demigod from one of the Norse gods as one of his parents. He, it's a minor spoiler, so I'm not going to get into that right now. But it's kind of just the same after that. You know, they go on a quest, they save the world. And it's not bad by any means, but I've said it a couple of times. It's just, yeah, it's the same stuff before. And... Honestly, Magnus himself, one of, one of the main like problems I have with the book is Magnus himself because he's just too powerful. Like, he has too many powers. He has the ability to heal people by touching them, which, yeah, okay, that's fine. It, it does tire him out a bit, but that's not a huge cost. And then he also has this ability to disarm whole armies of people. Like, their, their weapons will just fall on the ground when he yells and it'll take him a few minutes to get back into the swing of things, which, okay, that's kind of neat. But probably the most overpowered thing he has is that he gains the Sword of Summer, which is a sentient talking sword, and it can, like, fly around and do stuff and fight on its own, and all Magnus has to do is give it instructions, and it'll go off and do that. And so he'll just be like, hey, kill that giant, and he'll go and kill it, and it's pretty easy. Now, the only real limitation to that is that it requires the same amount of energy that it would have doing it manually. So, like, again, he kills a 2,000-foot giant with it, and as soon as it comes down and returns to his hand, he basically passes out because all of the energy was drained from him. Which, yeah, okay, that, that is a limitation, but it's not enough of a limitation. And I would say out of his powers, they should have been cut down on a bit more, because as it stands, he's kind of like 
the movie version of Percy Jackson. And I'll, I'll be talking about the movies at some point this month, don't worry. But basically, in the books, Percy is, you know, uh, he has a lot of powers, he's a good fighter, all that. But most of the situations he gets in, he has to think his way out, and he has to improvise a lot. And so, even though he could come across as a Mary Sue, he doesn't. Whereas Magnus just has all these cool powers, and movie Percy as well, they just have all these cool powers, and then they blow through whatever opposition they face with brute force most of the time. And so, yeah, it's 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 not great. So I, I would have recommended uh, Magnus's powers being just pulled back a little. Like, for example, if his sword... His name is Jack, by the way. The sword calls itself Jack. Uh, but if his sword could still, you know, fly around and do stuff, but it wasn't sentient and he had to manually control it, and it still had all the other same limitations, I think that could maybe work, because then he would still have to be the one doing it. It wouldn't feel like, you know, someone else doing it for him, but he's still in control. It, it's weird. Oh, or maybe if his healing powers, when he healed somebody, a lesser version of that same wound appeared on himself. Like, if someone had a broken ankle and he healed them, then he would get a sprained ankle, for example. Like, you know, th these are just things I came up with after a few minutes of brainstorming. And I really think they would have made not only the book better, but the character of Magnus a lot better. Uh, beyond that, it does mix up the formula a little bit in that it changes the party dynamic, because, like, in Harry Potter, you know, we had the three-person main cast. There's the hero, his male best friend, and the really smart girl who tags along and does a lot of the legwork, but doesn't actually get to save the day in the end. And uh, the Percy Jackson books did kind of the same thing with Percy, Grover, and Annabeth. This one mixes it up a bit because it has four people. We have Magnus, his friends Hearthstone and Blitzen, and then a new person named Samira joins in. And none of them really quite fit the same archetypes as old characters we've seen before. And they do have different specialties, and they all help out in their own way. They all have their own uh, unique personalities and backstories and everything. So that does... Uh, mix it up a little, that does go off formula and does break the mold somewhat, which I didn't quite appreciate as much when I was younger, but now looking at it, I'm like, yeah, I think that's I think that's a very good way of moving away from it while still holding true to what made it successful. And you probably already understand the format that this takes. They have this one big quest to save the world, and they go off to do that, and along the way they have to go and do a whole bunch of smaller side quests, which get them in trouble. And those are all fun, but you know how it's going to go from the beginning. And another minor issue I would say is that the final battle, while it is fine, it involves a lot of side characters who didn't get much screen time before this, and so they just kind of pop up and like, yeah, we're going to fight bad guys with you and help save the day. And then, like, we're supposed to be frightened for them and scared and hope, uh, oh man, I hope they don't die, and we're supposed to be sad when bad things happen to them, but we didn't really get the chance to do that. And later on, some of the side characters, who are mostly other Ein Heriar, who are in Valhalla with uh, Magnus in them, a as the books go on, they do get a little bit more development. I'll talk about that more in the third one. But as it is here, I just couldn't care that much about them. And so, at the end of the day, I can still say that, yeah, Sword of Summer is just sort of alright, and it should have been shaved down a bit, like maybe combine one or two of the side quests, but it's really not bad. And then we get to book two, The Hammer of Thor. Now this one is an improvement over the last one. This one I would say is still above average, you know, not mind-blowing or anything, but had I read it when I was younger, it might have been. It's hard to tell. And it's also a bit shorter than uh, The Sword of Summer. I think it's like 10% shorter, so that it, that is a good thing. It, it helps keep the storyline focused, even though it does still go off on various tangents. Like, I, I finished reading this one in like three days once I finally got around to starting it, which is pretty fast, even from my standards. And basically this one is, like the last one, uh, you have to get the item to save the world, which in this case means stopping Ragnarok, because Norse mythology, if you're unfamiliar, has this big prophecy that one day Ragnarok will come, destroy the entire world, and most of the gods and humans and everyone will all die. And it kind of sucks, and basically all they can do is delay Ragnarok, which is depressing, actually. It's, it's really depressing. In this instance, their goal is to get Mjolnir and return it to Thor because his hammer's been missing for a while, and then 
well, hopefully he can use it to stop the bad guys from doing bad things. But also, meanwhile, Loki, because obviously the Loki, Loki is the villain here. I, I feel like it would have been better if someone else had done it, but whatever, whatever. Loki's the villain here. He's being kind of manipulative. It, it's the same as before. It's pretty similar to what you've seen before this. The positives of this, other than, you know, trimming the fat to make it go faster, are that the characters are better, for the most part. Like, Magnus doesn't get much development at this point, I don't think. But uh, Samira, or Sam as she's usually called, uh, does not immediately have a romance with Magnus. In fact, she never does. It's made pretty clear, even from the first book, that she is in love with someone else, and they're already kind of sort of engaged. It's, it's a long story. But... Uh, she doesn't just fall into that archetype of, okay, she's the female friend who has to fall in love with him. Why? Because she's the female friend, that's just what happens. And even despite that, she still, she still kind of fills the Annabeth slash Hermione role, where she is more knowledgeable about the mythological world than uh, Magnus is, but overall, like, she is her own thing, which is pretty great. And then we also get introduced to a new character named Alex. Now, Alex is a child of Loki, and she is gender fluid. She's usually referred to as she, so I'll be doing that throughout most of this, but yeah, she is referred to as a he at a couple of points, and I mean, that's that's kind of neat. Like, I don't, I, I can't totally wrap my head around that whole thing, but like, I don't, I don't need to understand it. I just need to like, be supportive. Like, all right, y'all have fun. I think that Alex's backstory is kind of weak. Like, the way she winds up getting to Valhalla and her life before that, and her kind of sob story about, oh, my dad didn't like me very much, because L she's a child of Loki, but Loki is actually her mother, because Loki is a god and he can do things like that. <laughs> that That's kind of weak, but other than that, I think she's a great character. Like, again, she becomes friends with Magnus, and you can kind of tell, okay, there's something there, but they don't immediately jump into anything like that and she is a useful party member. Feels weird to call a party member, like this is an RPG, but she, you know, she's a very useful party member. Uh, she's knowledgeable about important stuff. She helps people out. It, overall, pretty great character. And then we get to the climax, and I think that's pretty strong. It's not the greatest ever. You know, it is the second part in a trilogy. So the idea is like, oh shit, we kind of sort of failed and the bad guys are getting ready to bring about Ragnarok, what next? And, I mean, I've seen it before, but it's strong. And then we get to book three, The Ship of the Dead. This is basically just them going off to re-imprison Loki to prevent him from bringing Ragnarok about. And it's, again, it's just they go off to do things, go on side quests, and then eventually they do save the day. That's not really a spoiler. What kind of book did you think this was? Uh, the main positive thing I will say is that the side characters do get more development. Like, uh, one of their fellow Einherji is a guy named Thomas Jefferson Jr. He was a half-black soldier from the American Civil War. As a brief aside, it feels kind of odd to name a half-black person Thomas Jefferson Jr., considering Thomas Jefferson's relationship with some of his slaves, but we're just gonna move on past that one. Like, he gets basically an entire side, one of their side quests is mostly focused on him and his attitude towards things and his uh, way of looking at the world. And yeah, that's kind of neat. And then there's another one, which is kind of similar for another character named Mallory and things like that. So while I do wish that some of this development had been brought in in earlier books, they do at least throw it in here. And in the end, they do re-imprison Loki, but I found myself wondering, why didn't the gods help this time? Like, 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 for real, like, in the Percy Jackson books, or, I mean, the original Percy Jackson books, not the, uh, Heroes of Olympus ones, but in the Percy Jackson books, in the final battle, m all of the gods of Olympus were busy fighting Typhon, because Typhon is just this unfathomably powerful monster that they had to work together to defeat, and if they didn't do that, then he would have just steamrolled everything, so the heroes were pretty much on their own when it came to stopping the forces of Kronos from getting to Olympus, which worked really well. You know, it's like, oh, hey, how come the super powerful guys can't just come in and save the day with a snap of their fingers? Well, it's because they're off doing other stuff. Whereas in Magnus Chase, why didn't the gods help? They don't really give any reason for it. Like, sure, the gods are 
kind of silly for the most part, but that's that's a lame excuse. And for that matter, most of the gods in this don't really feel godlike. And I know that that's kind of a staple of Riordan's work at this point, like the gods and monsters and stuff will show up and they'll be kind of silly and kind of fit in with the modern world, but at the same time, sometimes they can be intimidating and some of them can be scary even. But I, I don't know, just like most of them just sort of pop up and even if they don't feel silly, they don't really do that much to contribute to the story. Like, for example, Odin comes across as an idiot, like, why do you let this guy be in charge? And he doesn't really do anything throughout the whole story. Whereas Frey, who is Magnus's dad, Magnus really only gets one scene with him uh, near the end of the first book. That's the only time he ever meets, he's ever met him before in his life. And he's just kind of like, I love you, dad. And dad's like, I love you too, son. And then he leaves and he barely even thinks about him after that, which is... I don't know, I feel like they could have done something with that, like maybe he's resentful towards him, or he doesn't quite understand his dad, and there's kind of a distance there. I mean, granted, that was basically Percy and Poseidon, but, you know, the point is that there could have been something more there. And then there's other gods like Hell, who just pop up for, like, one scene, and do doesn't really even do anything, and then she's gone, and you never see her again. So the magic of seeing these gods kind of wears off after a while. The only one that I will say really feels godlike and really feels powerful and intimidating is Loki, which works because, you know, he's the main villain. He's supposed to be all that, but still, it, I do wish that this had maybe gone through, and I mean, like, the series as a whole had maybe gone through one more revision uh, to help with things like that, but overall, honestly, solid ending, and Magnus Chase and the Gods of Asgard, solid series. Like, if you think you're too old for, like, Percy Jackson and stuff, then this isn't going to change your mind, but it is still an enjoyable couple of books. All right, so now let's get into the expanded Riordan verse stuff. And <clears throat> I didn't really talk about a lot of stuff that I wanted to in the Magnus Chase review because a lot of it was the ways that it compares to other series. And I know I did still compare it to other series a fair bit, but, you know, work with me here. And also, this is going to be full of spoilers from here on out, so just, you know, be aware of that. But basically, in this expanded universe, all myths slash religions are all real. And they kind of bring it up in one of the Magnus Chase books. Uh, him and Annabeth were talking about it, and they basically came to the conclusion that as long as humans remember the stories, then those stories still have life. So that would mean, like, Greek, Norse, Egyptian, and Roman are all confirmed in this series. And it's also kind of implied that <laughs> the Jesus is around, too. But even beyond that, it, it would also seem other mythologies would still be included in there, which is kind of neat. Uh, I know a few other series have done things like that, but none of them have really taken full advantage of that, I don't think. Now, like I said, I have not read The Trials of Apollo, and I don't really feel like doing it. I read part of the first book years ago, and I just, I just didn't get into it. It was around the same time I read Magnus Chase, so, you know, I was just kind of getting tired of the formula. And this one, I will say, it, from everything I've found out at least, and if I'm wrong, feel free to yell at me, but this one is basically the one book in the series that doesn't really follow that Harry Potter formula. You know, it's a god that was cast down to Earth, and he's still going on adventures in this magical world, sure, but he's not a regular kid that gets pulled into all this. So it is different, I'm going to say, and I, I admit that's kind of arbitrary, but, you know, I don't feel like putting it in here, so I'm not putting it in here. Beyond that, all of the others, they all follow that formula, but they all break away at least a little bit, in, in some small ways at the very least. Like, in terms of main characters, Percy is basically the prototype of that. You know, he is the subject of a prophecy. He's really powerful, but he's not too overpowered. You know, he's the son of Poseidon, who's still a powerful god, but he's not the son of Zeus, who is like, you know, the king, the best one, yada yada. And then we get to Heroes of Olympus, which I still have all of mine right here. They're, look at these. These are much longer than the Percy Jackson ones, but it's okay because, well, they're following seven characters. And each of those seven characters is pretty well defined. None could really be called the protagonist, though. Like, you could maybe argue that Jason is the protagonist of The Lost Hero and that Percy is the protagonist of The Son of Neptune, but after that, they all get a pretty even amount of focus, which I'm okay with. 
Like, I think doing that is a different way of doing it. And then we get to the Kang Chronicles, which is all about Egyptian myth, and I don't have my copies anymore. I had some years ago that I got rid of because I, I used to not like the Kang Chronicles that much. Like, thinking all this over for this video has given me a new appreciation for them, but I didn't used to like them that much. But anyways, that has two main characters who switch back and forth, and it's still all in first person, but their POVs are distinct, so they don't get confused. And uh, they are siblings as well. You know, they have a pre-existing relationship that goes back to before the books start, and it might be strained at times, and it might be difficult at times, but it is a, uh, a relationship that's been around before, and we get to see them develop and become a little bit closer as a family and learn to understand and work with each other a little better. So, again, that's different from just having one guy who's subject of prophecy. And then we run into Magnus, who is basically just a weaker version of Percy. Because he's not a subject of a prophecy, but beyond that, he's like, okay, son of a powerful god, has all these cool powers, and then just kind of uses them to save the day. You know, and I was disappointed by that because he has a different setup, is the thing. Like, Percy starts off the first book, Percy's around uh, 12 years old, I believe, and he's only 16 by the last one. And, like, so we see him grow up, and when he reaches 16, that's almost like, okay, this is adulthood. I, I, I have to put quotes around it because 16-year-olds are really not adults, but uh, for, in the context of this series, like, this is his most mature form. Whereas Magnus starts off as being 16 years old, and more than that, he's had a lot more life experience than Percy has, like, in the, in the regular world, I should say. Because when he was 14, his mom died, he spent years mourning her and kind of getting over that, and he's also spent years being homeless on the streets of Boston. And so, I, I was thinking, like, okay, this might uh, affect his attitude towards things, it might make him more cynical, more jaded, more angry at the world, something like that, but they really don't do anything with it. And, like I said before, his relationship with Frey is pretty much the same as Percy's relationship with uh, uh, Poseidon. So, there's not that much different here. Like, the main... The, the one thing I can point to and say, yeah, I think that was done about as well as Percy, maybe slightly better, is his relationship with Alex, I think, is slightly better than Percy's with Annabeth. But what I'm getting at here is that while most of these characters are, you know, regular kids who are thrust into this magic world, they are still somewhat distinct from one another, and so I, I think it's only fair to, if I'm going to complain about the formula, I should point out where that formula was diverged from and how in some ways that worked, in, in some ways it worked really well, like I, I think it worked great in the Kane Chronicles and Heroes of Olympus, but it didn't always work out perfect either. And then we go to the storyline, which you may have guessed by now is pretty much the same in all of these, you know, bad guys want to destroy slash rule the world, and the good guys have to stop them. However, I will say that in the original Percy Jackson series, they kind of forgot to mention why Kronos taking over would be so bad. Like, at least for a couple of books. Like, I think it's not even until, like, the fourth book that they just sort of slap on there, like, oh, um, Kronos, when he was in charge, it was, uh, he was, things were bad for humans, ooh. And it, it really feels like they just threw it in there at last minute because... They just sort of assumed, well, Kronos wants to take over, and the heroes, or, and the readers, they love Zeus and how he runs things, even though we really don't. And that, in fact, that's a pretty big part of the series, is how a lot of demigods don't like how things are run, and they kind of have a point. And like I said, the gods really should help more in these, in these stories, like, particularly in Magnus Chase, the Norse gods, like, what, what were y'all doing? But... You know, at least in Heroes of Olympus, they had an excuse for it, and Percy Jackson, like I said, Typhon, but in Heroes of Olympus, they were also split between their Greek and Roman halves, because they were at war with each other, and it wasn't until the very end that they were able to stop the conflict, and then the gods just came in and helped everything. So that was, that was actually a very cool way of ending things, in my opinion. And then the Cain Chronicles, their relationship with the gods is a little bit weirder, so they really couldn't just swoop in and save the day the way the others could, but... Still, overall, the story for all these is more or less the same. Uh, there's really not much de deviation from it other than Kane Chronicles and Magnus Chase start off a little quicker than the others. If we talk about the side characters, like besides the protagonists, they're mostly really strong. Like, 
I remember a lot of the side characters from Percy Jackson. You know, I remember Clarice. I remember Selena Beauregard. I remember Luke and uh, Beckendorf and Chiron and all them. I remember a bunch of the side characters from Heroes of Olympus because, I mean, they, they have like seven main characters, but even beyond that, they had like their coach and stuff. And I, re I remember those guys. They, they did some stuff. They had distinct personalities. And Magnus Chase, for all the other faults that I've pointed out, the side characters do eventually get to be, they all get their moment to shine and they all get to stand out a little bit. I remember zero side characters from the Kane Chronicles. I remember the two leads and that's it. And granted, it has been a long time since I read it, but l Lord, it's been a long time since I read Percy Jackson too. Like, I think I've read this whole series like three times through and the last time I did it, I was like, eh, 16 maybe? which was about eight years ago, and I still remember it pretty well. So the fact that I can't really remember Kane Chronicles when I read that, eh, I think around the time I was 15, that says a lot. And this next bit doesn't really make that big of a difference to me personally, but I know it's important to a lot of other people, especially because a lot of people commented it on my last video, and that's that <clears throat> these casts are super diverse in terms of like race and religion and... Uh, <clears throat> Some of them have disabilities, and uh, like I was mentioning before, Alex is gender fluid, and <clears throat> wow, that hurts a lot. Wow, <laughs> I was just clearing my throat. That felt like nails were being jammed in me. Uh, but <laughs> there's that. Uh, they have a gay character in Heroes of Olympus, and they, they never actually say the word gay, I don't believe, though, which is a little interesting. I, I guess that's how he got it past the censors. I don't know. And Magnus himself, while well, they don't dwell on it a lot, he, like I said, gets into a relationship with a gender-fluid person, and he seems perfectly fine being intimate with them even when they are male, when they're on, like, a male day, or however that's described. I'm sorry if I don't do that right, but, you know, so he might be, like, bisexual or something. It's hard to say, but basically, all of that there, while it's not important to me personally, to other people it is. You know, other people like seeing people that are like them be represented in here, and if that's the case, then great! Awesome for you! And then we go to the worlds that all these books take place in, and that's a little... I don't know, that's a little weird. Like, the, basically we have the Greek, Roman, Egyptian, and Norse worlds. However, the Greek and Roman are kinda sorta the same, but they're also kinda sorta different, and that conflict between those is basically the whole plot of Heroes of Olympus. But even beyond that, the Norse and Greek worlds are basically just the same. You know, they have demigods, they fight using swords and spears and shit, uh, the gods are kind of silly, but at the same time they're kind of powerful and stuff, and evil ones want to do evil things, and the heroes have to save the day, and in all of these situations it's teenagers saving the world. Like, over the course of maybe three or four years, they're, they're going around and stopping all of these disasters from happening, which is making me really wonder what's happening in other mythologies out there. Uh, but that's that, that, that's not fun to think about. <laughs> I don't trust teenagers to do anything. Yeah, th those worlds really don't stand apart that much. And the Greek one at least has a little bit more depth because it has that conflict between the Greek and Roman sides, whereas the Norse one is just kind of off on its own. The most distinct one would have to be the Egyptian world, and that's because, you know, it doesn't really have demigods. I mean, the gods will, like, possess people as, and they'll be avatars for them, but it is different at the very least. Like, that's a much different way of them interacting with humans, and uh, magic is also playing a much bigger role here, so as opposed to just, my dad's Poseidon, I can control water and stuff like that, it's, you have to, like, learn how to do certain spells and stuff, and I, I don't know, I, I just like that. You know, it's not super complex or anything, but it does at least stand out a little bit. And I really do wish that this whole franchise, as it were, would have just embraced the different cosmology and different theologies and stuff and really tried to set them apart and make them stand out as much as they could from one another. Because, like, for imagine, imagine for a moment, like, how the Aztec world would work and how, like, well, we have to sacrifice all these humans, otherwise the world will, will end and how maybe the main characters have to be like, okay, we don't want to kill people, so maybe we should find some sort of substitute that they can use or find a way that they wouldn't have to do this anymore. Like, I don't know, that, that just could have been really interesting. But uh, that said, 
Rick Riordan does an amazing job at capturing the, uh, the feeling of real places that uh, the characters visit. Like, you know, when you're in New York, it really does feel like New York. Uh, in Magnus Chase, a lot of the action is in Boston because Boston is like the link between Midgard and the other worlds, which you'd think it'd be like Stockholm or something, but I don't know, whatever. And uh, the most notable one, notable one for me is in Battle of the Labyrinth, Percy and company go to Garden of the Gods and Colorado Springs, and they're not even there for that long. But, like, even just that little bit, it, they caught the feeling of it. Like, I could just read a little ways in there and go, yep, this is this is Colorado Springs. I know this place. This is, this is where I'm from. That's kind of neat. Obviously, I can't speak for a lot of other places. Like, in some of the books, they go to, like, Rome and York and Greece and stuff. And I can't really comment on how accurate that is. But I can say, like, you know, Colorado, New York, and the parts where they're in Southern California, those all do a really good job of capturing the feeling of it and still making them feel kind of distinct so that they aren't just in, like, okay, here's one blank room with this one type of monster, and then we defeat it, and then we go off to continue on our tw quest for a while, and then we hit another blank room, which is also defined by its monster. Like, no, it's a, it's like the environments themselves change and the events that transpire in those environments also change, which is really neat and not that easy to do. So overall, I will say that this whole franchise, this whole expanded universe, is almost perfect kids' adventures. Like, Percy Jackson books are some of my favorite of all time. Like, they, they just are. They're, they're amazing books. Maybe that's the nostalgia talking. I don't really care. They're still pretty great. And even the other series, while they do have their weak points, are not bad by any means. I, I don't think they are. And yeah, they, they don't really take advantage of the expanded universe, which is kind of a shame, but it is still neat that it's there. You know, like how in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, for example, a lot of stuff builds towards a bigger conflict. You know, they have all these individual stories, which just started off kind of referencing each other now and again, but then they kept building up until we finally reached like Infinity War and Endgame. And it was this huge ordeal which took like more than 20 movies to build towards and then we had this whole huge final battle and it was huge <laughs> i keep repeating myself a uh, whole huge final battle and it was amazing and i don't know it would have been kind of neat if there was something like that here like maybe all of the other pantheons team up to take down jesus or something that'd be kind of neat but you know it doesn't have to be that way you know having to like, read all these different series would be super time-consuming, and so it might be great for people to just be able to pick up the King Chronicles and read through it and pick up, hey, they're kind of referencing some Greek stuff here, that's kind of weird, and then later read Percy Jackson or something and go, oh, I see what they're doing, but, you know, it, it is still a bit of a missed opportunity, and I don't think I've really seen any franchise that's used this similar idea, like God of War, for instance, you know, they started off in Greek stuff and now it's doing... Norse stuff, and I've heard American Gods is similar, but everything I've seen about that show is extremely boring, so I don't want to look more into it. But, you know, they, you could have all this conflict between them be explored a lot more, and that, that would be really interesting, because a lot of these are kind of mutually exclusive ideas, and I'm not sure how they would exist parallel to one another, but they... They do. Sometimes the world doesn't have to make sense. And we're coming to the end of this, so I'm just going to rank all the series from best to worst. Best is Percy Jackson and the Olympians. Kind of goes without saying. It's like, like I said, one of my favorite book series of all time. It's basically perfect in most ways. It's It perfects the Harry Potter formula. Nothing else quite comes to that level. Uh, then we have Heroes of Olympus, which is, you know, basically just a continuation of the same story. So we have a bunch of the same characters that we know and love. Uh, along with a bunch of new ones that we get to know and also love. Uh, we have a whole new threat, which is even bigger than before, because we have, like, the giants who are perfectly created to oppose the Olympians and all that. It's, it's really cool, and I think that it has some amazing cliffhanger endings in some of the books, and the finale of the last one is also fantastic. So, yeah, that one's a solid second place. And then we go to the Kane Chronicles. Now, Kane Chronicles, I... It used to just be something I didn't like that much, but honestly, looking back at this, it did break the mold in a lot of ways that the other series didn't. You know, it's it's still not great. I still think the last book is pretty weak because it's basically just 
here's our plan to defeat the bad guy, and then they go through the steps to complete that plan, and then it kind of goes off without a hitch, so it's just, it's not nearly as interesting as it could have been. But, you know, it did break away from the formula in some ways, and I always want to give points for originality. And then, I kind of feel bad for doing this, but I have to put Magnus Chase and the Gods of Asgard in last place, because while, I've, I've said it before, I'll say it again, it's not a bad book series by any stretch. It's, it's just not. It, there's a lot of fun stuff in there. There's a lot of depth, or not a lot of depth, but there is some depth to like characters and the world and stuff. But overall, it's just kind of a weaker version of the Percy Jackson and the Olympians formula. You know, it doesn't break away as much as I would like it to, and it doesn't do as good a job as fo at following it as the Percy Jackson ones do, so... Yeah, it's uh, not not bad, but it is in last place. And that's about it, you know? I just uh, this didn't really have a central thesis or anything because, well, I don't, I don't think it really needs one in this case. I, obviously, I like doing video essays and stuff and being a little more analytical and intellectual about it, but, you know, sometimes I just want to point out that, yeah, these are, these are fun books. They're really good. There's some depth to them. There's some stuff you can analyze about it, but overall, they're just really fun books with a few missteps, and I, I don't know, it's one of the things that got me to love reading so much and kind of helped inspire me with various other things in my life, and hopefully it did the same for you, and it's basically just a better version of Harry Potter overall. So, that's about it. Alright, you know how this works by now. All the names on here are people that gave me money, and the people that gave me $10 and more are Apo Savalanian, Olivia Rayan, Ava Toomer, Brandon S. Pilcher, Brother Santodes, Christopher Quinten, Datboy805, Embis, Pfizer, Jeremy, Joel, Karkat Kitsune, Kevin Zhang, Liza Rudakova, Madison Lewis Bennett, Mel Austin, Microphone, Sad Mardigan, Tobacco Crow, Tom Beanie, and Vevictus. You guys are the best. If you want stuff like early access to my videos or just voting on future video topics, then consider sending me money. And if you don't want to do that, then become a YouTube channel member. Or just like this video, share it around and stuff. It really does help. And uh, that's uh, about everything I'm supposed to say here, so I'll see you later. Bye.